Greetings guest. Welcome to the patriarchy where we explore cinema classics fueled by predictive Hollywood programming and unpack how our favorite characters in cinema got egg all over their faces. I am your commentator Dom and tonight we're unpacking Beetlejuice Beetlejuice. I thought it would be fun to wrap up spooky season with a review of Beetlejuice Beetlejuice and talk about how nearly all of the women in that film got completely screwed over, like literally two generations of women in the same family completely screwed by their men. Now, as this movie was just released in September, this video will contain some spoilers, so if you haven't seen Beetlejuice Beetlejuice yet, I suggest you click away and indulge in this spooky season playlist that I'm linking right here. It's also linked in the comments below for your convenience. A quick review of the plot, it's 2024 and our favorite goth girl, Lydia Dietz, played by Winona Ryder, is all grown up and has found herself in a very fitting and lucrative career as the host of the supernatural TV show, Ghost House, which is sort of like a paranormal activity show. Anyways, she has a very estranged relationship with her daughter Astrid, played by Jenna Ortega, who's in boarding school and we really see the strain between the three generations of women, Lydia, her stepmom Delia, played by Catherine O'Hara, and her daughter Astrid, when Lydia's father dies and they all come together to plan his funeral and honor his life. Now there are so many things going on in this movie, so many subplots like Beetlejuice trying to escape his quote unquote crazy ex-wife. Delia trying to find her dearly departed husband in the afterlife. But the crux of the main plot is that Lydia has to save her daughter Astrid after Astrid got tricked into giving up her soul and going to the afterlife, which we'll go into more detail on in a minute. As a disclaimer, this movie is still out in theaters as this is being recorded, so I've only seen it once, so forgive me if I leave some details out and also feel free to add those details in the comment section. Let's start by taking a closer look at Astrid's situation. As previously stated, Astrid is the wayward daughter of Lydia Dietz, and the film starts off with her in boarding school. She's a bit of an outcast and mocked because of who her mom is, so she's coping with that. Also, her dad died when she was younger, so she just has a lot of trauma that she's trying to work through. Her grandfather's death is what brings her back to her hometown of Winter River, Connecticut. And while in Winter River, a lot is happening. It's her grandfather's funeral and wake. It's also around Halloween time. And it's also days before her mother's wedding, which we'll get to that later when we talk about Lydia. But Astrid just becomes very overwhelmed with all of the family stuff, as all teens do. So while she's out in her hometown, she meets a boy, Jeremy, and because he's cute and sympathetic and a little weird like her, she falls for the guy. Now Astrid misses some major red flags like his eerie parents, the state of his house, his house is the only house on the block without Halloween decorations, the fact that he can't leave his house, him wearing the same clothes two days in a row. The fact that he happens to have a copy of the Handbook for the Dead. But essentially, Jeremy tricks this very naive Astrid into giving her soul to him so that he could come back to life. So yes, you heard that right. And if you've seen the film, you'll already know that Jeremy is actually a ghost. It turns out Astrid is more like her mom than she realizes. And Jeremy is not just any kind of ghost, but a psychopathic ghost who murdered his own parents. So playing on Astrid's emotions and trauma, she literally bared her soul to this guy way too soon. And Jeremy, once learning that Astrid's dad was also deceased, says, I can help you. Come to my house. I'm going to draw a portal on the wall while you recite some weird chants from this handbook for the recently deceased. Astrid very apprehensively does this, a lesson in listening to your guts, ladies, and bam, bamboozled by Bay. Beetlejuice is instrumental in helping Lydia get her daughter back. You and the boys stand guard. Nobody gets through. Oh. Let's go, honey. But tricked into giving your soul away to a guy that you've only known for two days, she learned this fast track lifestyle when it comes to love from her mom. No. Now, let's talk about Lydia. So Lydia, our favorite goth girl, 
We can't be too hard on Lydia, but how does she grow into a woman who can't clearly see that she's dating an opportunist? I mean, am I remembering the original movie correctly or what? Like, she was, as a teen, the most sensible one in her family. The character arc from the original film to now just doesn't make any sense to me, but here we are. Lydia is dating Rory a producer on the show that she hosts, and Rory plays one of those very slimy Hollywood types. Don't say his name. If you say his name three times, he will appear. I'm gonna give you the push you need. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. He's even got the slicked back hair to top it off, but he's overbearing, so cheesy and fake. No one likes him. I want you to know that I could be that kind of dope dad dude for you, you know? Red flag, he proposes to Lydia at her dad's wake, triple red flag, then pressures her to marry him on Halloween, which is in two days. And Lydia very, very, very apprehensively agrees to this. Again, listen to your gut. Now are we seeing how Astrid ended up with a manipulative, opportunistic male? She witnessed this happen to her mom, but instead of learning the lesson, she repeated it by gushing over the first guy who showed her some attention. So Rory wants to marry Lydia solely so that he can exploit her for her money. See, men are gold diggers too. And the marriage never happens because of Beetlejuice's interjection once again. But I think this is a great lesson in mothers needing to serve as models for their daughters with the types of men that they entertain and the types of boundaries that they set with men in general. We're going to wrap up with Delia, the stepmom that no one wanted. <laughs> so I'll start by saying I have no beef with Charles's character, that's Lydia's or that's Delia's husband. I've never seen him as particularly problematic. Delia was though, but Delia's death was her own doing. She was screwing around with some snakes while performing some sort of ceremony for her late husband when one of the venomous snakes that she thought was defanged bit her. So this was the only true love story in the film. There were so many other opportunities though, but these two, Delia and Charles, finding each other in the afterlife, especially since they were such integral characters in the original movie, is almost touching. So if you've seen Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, let me know in the comments. How did you like the sequel compared to the original? And how did Lydia become so gullible to get mixed up with a character like Rory? Share your thoughts down below. Also like, share, and subscribe if you've enjoyed the content. Signing off now, happy Halloween, your friend Dom.